Friday, May 3rd, was World Press Freedom Day, declared by the United Nations General Assembly to raise awareness of the importance of freedom of the press and remind governments of their duty to respect and uphold the right of freedom of expression enshrined under Article 19 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and marking the anniversary of the Windeck Declaration of 1991. Journalists are usually the last people to ever talk about themselves because they're more concerned about getting the story across no matter how difficult, even when it goes against the religion, beliefs, or political leanings. In the world we live in today, it's hard to maintain a balance, especially when there is a clear political divide. How to stay focused, how to remain balanced, and how to handle emotion in all of these. I speak to someone I like to call a veteran in the business, who's worked behind the scenes in some of the biggest news media in America. Today, she teaches broadcast journalism at Howard University in Washington. Professor Jennifer Thomas, let me ask the questions you've always wanted to know and cannot ask sometimes. All right, Professor Thomas, thank you uh, for uh, speaking with us today and uh, welcome to Nigeria. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. You've been here just a few days. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on the country? Yes, well, I'm so excited to be here in Nigeria and here in Lagos. And when I first arrived into the airport uh, it's kind of I think it was a heartwarming story for me when I get off and you know you have to go one way if you have an international passport one way if you have a Nigerian passport so the sister was like no sister she was pointing me in the direction of the Nigerian <laughs> passport so I was like oh you think I'm Nigerian so that was a good welcome to me and it's been that way ever since since I've been here the past few days uh, Nigeria is a huge city um, it reminds me of New York City. There's just a hustle and bustle everywhere you go. People are all over in the streets. The traffic's horrible. <laughs> but aside from that, um, the people have just been so warm. Everyone's been warm and friendly. And it's just interesting to see, like, it's like, I would say, a kaleidoscope of culture that you see from all around. So it's just been a great experience so far. It really has. I know you've also had the opportunity to, to, to you know, watch some news networks here in Nigeria, uh, when, you, when you watch them, what do you see as the similarities between the ones here and the ones in the U.S.? Do you find that they also talk as much about politics as they do in the United States? I have seen some in the morning because my schedule, I'm here um, as a guest from the U.S. consulate and they've taken great care of me. But we, our mornings have started quite early, so by the time I get up, and get ready to get out the door. I don't see much, and I'm trying to catch up all around. But I have seen some, and I've liked the mixture of a lot of the live interviews that are done in studio, a recap of a lot of the news that's going on, not just here in Nigeria, but around the world. So I, everything looks great to me from a news perspective. So yes, I think it's important for us to cover more politics. Now, I will say, that I don't see as much here in, the, um, in Nigeria as I have in the U.S. with just strict interviews with uh, people giving commentary about the news. Uh, I see more of people sharing the news or maybe experts saying a little, but right now a lot of the news shows are dominant with just people giving opinions on one side or the other. So sometimes when you do that so much, you miss the stories about the topics and about the policies and those what we may call sidebar stories or long form stories about the topics they're talking about. So if we talk about the economy, instead of having someone debate the issues, tell how it's affecting that you know private uh, business owner or that person who wants to get above minimum wage. Uh, and that's been a big issue in the U.S., whether it should be raised nationally or by a different state. So there are a lot of commonalities with the issues at hand, and I think it's important for, you know, the public to be informed. So I think sometimes, you know, we can't always give the audience what we think they want. I guess it's sort of like with kids. They don't want the vegetables, but they need them. <laughs> Sometimes we may not want to talk about or hear about politics all the time, but it's important because we need to know about these policies that affect our everyday lives. Then how does a journalist make the distinction, you know, of reporting a story without, you know, representing his or her opinion in the story? That's a great question because that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges right now because a lot of politics in America is so polarized and it does tend to bleed over sometimes. I don't think it should. And I don't think that journalists anywhere really, but uh, particularly in the U.S. as you asked me, 
I don't think we should uh, give our opinions on air. And something I would always say, what I say to my students that I teach now is that, um, of course, I have an opinion. We all have opinions. But if you watch one of my newscasts, you will not know what side I fall on. So I think it's a real challenge, but, you know, we have sort of this formula where we tell the facts of the story and then you let the sound bites give the opinion. And if you let one side give it, then you have to let the other side give it. And when you speak about it, CNN, I remember when I was there, you know, even covering uh, George Bush election in the uh, 2000 elections. When we would have stories uh, dealing with, say, a candidate was giving a speech and they spoke for 12 minutes. Then the other opponent that was running for that same office, the other candidate, we had to also give them the same time. So it was very cognizant, and that was down to how long the sound bite was, how long the interview was, or someone from that one campaign, well, then you have to have someone from the other camp. So it was very deliberate. Uh, I don't know if now that's done so, so much, um, but I think it should be, because I definitely do not agree with uh, politicians um, with uh, journalists, rather, giving their opinions about what politicians. But you also have to deal with the criticism that comes with, you know, reporting, you know, different uh, stories, especially when it comes to politics. Everyone has an opinion. And if your opinion is not what people are thinking, they criticize you and say you're on this side. How do you navigate through that? I think part of it is when you're reporting on a story, so if there's a narrative that's out there, um, and people have a strong reaction, or if there's a narrative or something that's put out there that just isn't true on its face, you have to report that, and then you have to explain why that's not true. And it may seem, I think, that people may feel the reporter feels that way when, in fact, that person is really doing his or her job. I have to tell you why the story isn't true. This is why it's problematic. And when it comes to if that's someone in a higher office or a government official, well, that's, you know, at its core what our job is to do, and that is to be the defender of democracy and to hold the government accountable. And I think a lot of times, because we're in such a polarized place right now, um, and so much of the news that's out there seems to be one-sided, that that's where the reporting tends to be. Um, and it's hard to say something is not fair when you're just showing that something isn't true. Then what is the other side? You know, I'm telling you this is not the case. There really isn't the other side of that. Um, but it's just... It's, it's an interesting time right now for journalists, and I think it's a great time, you know, with World Press Freedom Day to remind ourselves of why we are in this business to begin with, because it's really not about us. Um, it's just giving a voice for the voiceless, so to speak, and just making sure that we defend the public's right to know. But we need to do that in an objective, in an, uh, being objective. <laughs> Um, in our reporting and in our storytelling. Must every good story draw a reaction? Oh, uh, not necessarily, because if we're, I think news can inform, it can educate, and at times it can also entertain. But if we think about just what makes a great story, I think we all say stories have to have faith. They should be fair, they should be accurate, it should be interesting, it should be thorough, and it should be human. And if it can have all of those elements, then you've done your job. Welcome back. And let's head back to Professor Thomas's interview as she reveals more from her experience. The highlight of your career is the 9-11 attacks uh, on, uh, the, on the United States. Um, tell us what was going through your mind on that day and what you did, how you represented what was going on without having your emotions ha have the better of you. That day, it's like one, really they say the day that goes down in infamy. Most people think about um, with the start of the Second World War. For me, September 11th was one of those days that just stick with you at all times. And in fact, I couldn't really talk about it for the first 10 years, to be quite honest. But that day, I was a producer at CNN. I produced the 9 a.m. show. Um, and as most people know, the first uh, plane hit one of the first towers uh, just before 9. 
And I remember it was this still quiet day, it was, as we would call it, a slow news day. There was not much going on. A little bit of trivia uh, that people may not know is that day Michael Jordan was supposed to announce his return to the NBA. Mm -hmm. And so in our morning meetings, we had uh, one of our anchors at the time said, if Michael Jackson... I mean, Michael Jordan comes back to the NBA, I'll shave my head. So we were going to call him out on it, and we had the art department make a little sketch, and we had the whole thing planned. So we were just like, let's get to the end of the show so we can get to this cute kicker, um, which is interesting because that's just what was happening that day. And then just before uh, the newscast came on, we heard what sounded like thunder, and there were people running down from our editorial meeting upstairs into the newsroom, and at that time our newsroom our set was in the center of the newsroom, and my desk was right near, um, and they announced something happened, um, and a plane hit one of the Twin Towers in New York City, so we, I immediately grabbed my headsets, and we ran into the control room, and I was there for the next, I don't know how many hours, um, with the coverage. So that was just, you know, that's one of those days where you just go into autopilot, so you don't really you have to take yourself out of yourself. And that's when I think all those years of training prior to set in. So it's then get the information out, you know, that basic who, what, when, where, why. But much of that we didn't know except what. We saw what happened. We didn't know by whom. We didn't know why and we knew where. But we still didn't know where because there were other planes out there. So everything was happening simultaneously. Um, and as you know, the control room is quite chaotic. So we were on the phone with New York, uh, the Pentagon, the State Department, producers all over. Um, and that's when the synergy comes in with professionals all over. There were, we could see the cameras because the president was traveling that day. So the cameras are always with the president. So we could see his reaction off camera. Uh, so it was, you know, there were just things that were happening over and over. And then the second plane hit and then the Pentagon. So all these things were happening. And we were trying to make these quick decisions uh, collectively on what can you show by informing and what's too graphic. But some of it we had to show because that's what was happening. But it was very, very difficult. And then people don't think about the days following. So I was in the control room. I wasn't on the ground. But we were seeing all of the images as they came in and, you know, editing them. Or, well, most of it wasn't editing, just queuing up raw video or unedited video to turn around to show the world at that point. So it was, um, it was a really difficult day. But then as the days progressed, then it was looking for loved ones. Who caused it? Is America now under, are we going to have attacks again? Then it became those other stories of the storytelling, bringing people on who were looking for their loved ones, the health hack. You know, there were so many things that were going on. Uh, so it was one of those days that, bring, that brought us together closer as news professionals, but it was a, a day that I pray never happens again. And when it first happened, it, it had already, it, we were showing, what was happening at that moment, we were showing the live newscast yeah, live from um, our affiliate in New York, one of the affiliates. So it wasn't our camera, but we were carrying their live feed because they were on the scene. And our, uh, the anchors were talking over the video that was coming in from this other affiliate. And I remember clearly because we were all just still trying to figure out, you know, on phones, talking to people. And I remember saying, wait a minute, looks like something just hit that other building. We didn't know what happened initially. So we were on, as we say, the back row in the control room. And we were like, cue that video up. And so I told my associate producer and she queued up. And that's when we saw something was going. And it looked like a toy. It looked like a toy um, plane, if you remember. So that happened, but uh, that honestly happened without our knowing that was what was airing because everything was just happening so fast. And then after that is when we realized that was another plane that had gone in. So that, that's the story behind that story. That's the story behind the story. But for those who were at the forefront, those who had to report the story, I know it was a really emotional day for a lot of people. Uh, even the journalists, the reporters, the anchors, how did they report? represent you know what had to be done without having their emotions also interfere 
You know, I think that's when, I th for all of us, but especially for them, that's when I think the training sets in. And as we say, that's why they are in those seats. Because what you do uh, in a breaking news situation when you don't have all the facts, what is it that you say? Well, that's when you start giving what the information that you do know. This is the scene around New York. This is how populated it is. And they just went into autopilot, too. So they started just reporting what they could see, the things they know, getting people on the phone. And I think because we were all doing so much, and we had all, you know, we were in their ears on IFB telling them, you know, let's go here, let's go there. I don't think they had a time to really um, take in and digest what was really going on at that time. Um, and that's why I said for many of us, they brought counselors in because we had to work seven days a week, you know, and then the security restrictions went off at the airport. There were all these things going on. Um, so many people had a lot of after effects that they probably didn't realize, and especially for those who were there um, on the ground. But then we had to think about those first responders and the people that were running across those bridges, you know, trying to get home. And then you just start thinking of who can we talk to, and you have to put aside, I'm really sorry for what you're going through, but would you will be willing to share your story? And you don't even think about it until later. And that's when you, that's when you just kind of let it go and have a moment. And they did a great job with that. Have you ever covered a story you wish you, you were part of uh, uh, at the end of the day? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Well, I've covered some great stories. One story that I actually was able to become part of a story is I was working with NBC and we were doing special coverage uh, from San Francisco. And I said, well, if we're going to do a Christmas special in San Francisco, then I want to be responsible for one of our um, parts of the coverage, which is Napa Valley, <laughs> which is the wine country in, uh, in the U.S. And I had a chance to produce that entire segment and so I was out with my videographer we went out to Napa Valley we shot all the video I wrote all the scripts and then the um, anchor or the presenter voiced it over but the the most exciting part of that was we had an opportunity to view the wine country from a hot air balloon that was one of my favorite experiences because I was out of the control room and it was the most peaceful heavenly experience I've ever experienced and it was just wonderful so we you know we're all through and it's like okay I get paid to do this um, but there are lots of stories about people and you know feel good stories and it's always about the people but that was one of my um, I think one of my favorite stories that and uh, being able to cover the Olympic Games uh, 1996 and just being there to oh, see I the camaraderie yes. and um, everything and there were so we did a story about the old um, and, and then after that covering the conventions that same year so we spoke to the oldest delegate at the convention and then the youngest delegate you know so just telling those great stories and what's your story on Nigerian food yeah so okay I've had moi moi did I say it right yes I've had vegetable soup I've had the different rices, so it's the, <laughs> what is it called, the um, jello rice. Yes, I've had the rice, and um, I was advised very strongly that you do not take sides on whose rice is better. And I don't know if, uh, what rice it was, mm -hmm. I assume it was not the Ghanaian rice because I'm here in Nigeria. But I just know it was delicious, and I love rice anyway. But all the food has been good, a little spicy. <laughs> but nonetheless delicious. Yeah. And that's a wrap on the program this week. Thanks again for joining us. You know, you can still reach us using any of the addresses showing on your screen. Send me a message at Amarachi underscore Ubani on Twitter. I am Amarachi Ubani. Bye for now.